There is nothing we should be quite so grateful for as the last line of a poem that goes, when your own heart asks, be resolved, young samurai, and tell the world what you witness here today. With the death of two gods, a new era is born, a future full of promise and uncertainty. Welcome to a special edition of Mimic of the Five Rings on the It's a Mimic channel. I'm Roman, and with me today are Mayan and Steve. In this episode, we're going to be sharing some of our experiences surrounding campaign building for the fourth edition of the Legend of the Five Rings RPG. But before we get into that, I have to ask, do you guys have any ideas for the next L5R game you'd like to run? Oh, man. Funny that you should ask that, <clears throat> since, uh, I don't know, what was it, a couple days ago, you were like, you should run a game, and I was just like, nah. Yeah, Steve, run a game! I don't want to run a game, and then I got thinking about it, because of course I got thinking about it, <laughs> and uh, I actually do have a game that I am in the early stages of conceptualizing. So Steve, there's this thing, this uh -huh. concept that I'd like to uh, uh, float to you, called, called brainwashing? Leading a horse to water? Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> Basically the same thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You just wash the horse in the water. With the water. In the brain. <laughs> Wait, no, I didn't. Did I waterboard you? <laughs> <laughs> Is that part of the brainwashing process? So, okay, so tell me about the parlay. What is this? Okay, so, I mean, I, I don't want to get too, too in-depth about it because it is a mystery concept. Uh, so it'll be sort of a, uh, I guess, a bit of a whodunit. We love um, a whodunit. Does it involve tiny whores? No, it does not involve whores, tiny or otherwise. Okay, fine. So Fair you're enough. probably not going to be interested in <laughs> No, no, I'd still be interested. <laughs> so this is not a scorpion game? It's, no, it's mm. not really a clan game. It's going to be sort of a... It'll, it'll be probably based around a court. Okay. Okay. And, uh, or at least sort of a, a visiting delegation of assorted samurai. Fair. Uh, and there will be a string of mysterious murders, mm. and it will be up to the party to, to uh, determine exactly what is happening and why and who is doing it. Megan's love a whodunit. I love a good whodunit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, you're invited, Megan. Phenomenal. Thanks, Congratulations. Steve. That's, I was fishing for that, but you didn't have to say it. Yes, I, would, I promise. Like, I was... <laughs> Steve, I'm glad that you've decided to to pick up the reins again and do some do some stuff. It's been a minute, you know, and uh, I've got a lot of other ideas sort of on the back burner. I just need to sort of actually sit down and... Act on them. Yes. Yeah. So this is one of the things that is now on on the burner. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, I don't know, I, I can't, I can't say too much, because if you guys are going to be in it, I can't talk about it, because, uh, that's sort of the thing with mysteries, is that if I tell you, you anything, it kind of ruins the experience. Fair enough. That's yes. fair. How about you, Megan? Do you have any ideas for your next L5R game? So, in the small campaign that I played was my old, like, my D&D group decided they wanted to play an L5R campaign, and it ended on a note where all of those of the different clans went in separate directions. And so for my next campaign, I have an idea to pick one of those directions and play that story out. Mm. Because I played a campaign where it was um, Phoenix, Dragon, and Mantis. And at the end of the campaign, all of those characters went in different directions. Mm. So my idea is to play the Dragon direction uh, because they are playing a big part in the current main campaign in the background mm. in fighting their own liberation process. Uh, but I also want to play a Mantis game because Mantis played a true place to my heart. But like it was a good way to end that campaign that they all took different directions. It gave me so many options as a storyteller to pick what direction we go in next. So um, it's going to be interesting to see what I decide because I have different ideas for all three directions. Um, so it'll come down to whatever I decide at the end of the day. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. I have a game that I'm planning on running my session zero for on Sunday. Mm -hmm. where I'm taking a bunch of people who have never played the game before, and I'm going to be running them through um, a, a game that's gonna, going to be very near and dear to my heart. It is the, the first run of a game that I'm going to be using to teach people how to play Legend of the Five Rings going forward. Uh, and it is about trying to find uh, two lost nobles during a festival dedicated to the fortune of fools. Um, 
the next full-fledged campaign that I'm planning on running is going to be sort of like a, not, not, not like a reboot, but a new chapter in the true canon that I've been working on for a very long time. And it's going to be based around this idea of taking a road trip with some of your childhood friends and helping someone that you have known for most of their life make their way to their destiny. So for those of you who have played Final Fantasy XV... I was going to say. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's very heavily influenced by that. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very excited for both of these games, both for very different reasons. Mm -hmm. But enough of that. We are so lucky to be here today to talk about all the things in this setting and of this world and of L5R that, you know, we love and that, you know, mean so much to us. Uh, and we are so lucky to have been playing together in this game for such a long time. And a big part of that is playing in a world that has sort of grown with us and grown over time. But at the end of the day, we're kind of talking about what it's like to have a game that has multiple games in a persistent world. So we've been very lucky, Steve and I, to play in the world that Roman has created over time, which yep. is developed within Rokugan, using chronological accuracy to a degree, but then changing it to placate again. <laughs> Um, to, <laughs> the, to the necessities of its players and where we take the storyline, right? But when you're playing in a game that has multiple storylines happening at once, that can sometimes be hard to manage. So today we're going to be kind of talking about those kinds of pieces. So some things to consider, I guess, Roman, if you have any, like, what are some of the things that you consider when talking about games that happen over time within a large world? So chronology and canon are two big parts of it. What is the point that you're going to be starting at and what does that mean in terms of the world that you're in? Starting a game in the age of exploration is very different from starting a game at the dawn of the empire as we have gone over in the past. Looking at the effects of lives and deaths of both your characters as well as you know important historical figures that you have said, you know what, in this game, uh, the daimyo of the Crane Clan is going to die. What does that mean for generations down the line? How does that affect that bloodline and those families and the Crane Clan as a whole looking forward? What are the political effects of if in one era you decide that you are going to cause a war between these two families or you're going to cause a famine in these lands? How does that affect the clan going forward? A lot of these things that normally you wouldn't really have to think about if you were just playing some smaller, more contained games. Like a module of some kind. Like a like a one shot that isn't necessarily like is going to impact a longer standing game. Like it doesn't have the same impact to a lot of people. Um, whereas like we are experienced currently is that no matter how small the game we play, we know we're playing in a timeline that is going to affect things down the line. It gets tricky, too, when you consider the fact that we've played games that happen concurrently. Mm -hmm. So, like, events that are happening in one part of the world could potentially affect, like, the way things play out, you know, in another. Um, it, it's not too often that this happens, but every once in a while we have ended up in a situation where, like, yeah, like, we're, we're running two games, either two games, like, back-to-back, -back, or two games, like, that overlap a little bit. And it does have influence on what's happening uh, elsewhere or, you know, like the things that we did in the last game will directly change how the next game rolls out because of them. Um, so those are all things that need to be considered. And like it, it means a lot of note taking, I think, you know, obviously I'm not the one running these, but I can only imagine the amount of like bookkeeping that's required to keep track of like, oh, these things have happened. How does that change X, Y, Z? Yeah, because at the end of the day, it's one thing to play, again, a, a game of war and battle or that resulted in a court or a court game that resulted in a war. And then feeling like, OK, yes, this war is happening between these two clans because the result of this like court that occurred. But if you're playing when that war is occurring, if you're playing a different clan that was not a part of either of that court or that war, but they're like, let's say you had a court between, again, like the crane and the mantis about something on the coast. And then at the imagine. same, imagine, shall we say, but at the same time, some there's things happening in the unicorn clan yep. that, you know, so you could chronologically, even though you've played that court game and that war, 
go back and talk about what happened in the Unicorn Clan sure. during that time frame. Well, I think that's interesting, too, because, I mean, the thing with how this all plays out is when you play a game that goes from point A to point B and then you're done, you don't have to worry about any of those after effects. Mm -hmm. You know, like, if the end of your eight-session campaign ends in, oh, you know, like, half the party dies and a war is sparked off but you kill the big bad, well, that's fine because, like, it doesn't really matter. Like, you know, is it sad that some of the characters died? Sure, you can put some impact on it and have, you know, uh, a post-credits, you know, session where you talk about where everybody ends up and da-da-da-da-da. But when it happens in a setting like this where you know it's not the end all of the world the world doesn't just sort of fold up into a box and get put away as a okay you know story told we're done it becomes a okay well those three characters are now dead mm -hmm. they will not come back they will not have children beyond the ones they've already had they yeah. will not continue their legacy on into the world whereas the characters who lived will and the war that you've set off will and the person that you killed the big bad he is now dead and no longer a threat like, those are all the things that have to be considered and thought about to continue your storyline. And I think that comes with pros and cons, because as a storyteller, it means that you are constrained by the things that your players have done for telling future stories. But it also means that you have a framework to work from and an idea of like, ah, yeah, th these are the things that we told together. Let's use that to, to forward the story and come up with something interesting based on what's happened in the past. Yeah, you're dealing with the result, yes. right, as something that has technically in that campaign resolved itself for those players and they move on to different things yeah. but for their children or future people in the future generations it may affect them down the line and to my point earlier it'll affect the other clans in different ways right it may affect how the like trade routes work it right. might affect how um how people get certain products again trade routes or it might affect the way that like their wars and their um alignments work or alliances outside of the Empire. Yeah, like it's going to affect all those pieces. And I think that's the beauty of Rokugan and the fact that it's so confined to this one space is that everything that you do, if you are to continue a long line storyline, it's going to affect all of these pieces down the line. Yep. And I think that that, yes, it feels like you're kind of pigeonholing yourself into this one specific process. But if you actually like open it up to yourself to be like, okay, but each clan is going to react to it differently opens up that storyline playability sure. to say, yeah, this clan is going to re react to it differently, which means we're going to play a different story in these lands. Yep. And that's that's a large part of why I like having multiple people run games in the world that we've all sort of created together. Mm -hmm. Because I know which clans that I like to tell stories in. Like, I try and spread the love the best that I can. I try and explore different kinds of stories in different clans and different things, but... The stories that I like to tell and the adventures that I like to go on are very different from the adventures that you like to go on or Steve likes to go on or some of the other adventures that we've been on. Um, our buddy, who is a big crane player, decided that he was going to run a story in the crane lands that was basically a zombie horror story, mm -hmm. as well as a bit of a almost like Resident Evil style. There is this thing that has broken out within the crane lands and it's affecting crane peasants and it's spreading to crane nobles and who's behind it all what does it mean why does it exist and so like that is the sort of to story that i would not have told of my own volition yeah because uh, it's not necessarily your style no it's it's but not it's gonna at be all. somebody else's yeah and it's Hi. still still really exciting <laughs> really engaging and i was lucky enough to play in that game and experience that and while it's not the kind of story that i would have told it was so engaging and so exciting to be present and watch another storyteller engage in that and then to incorporate parts of that into the world later on mm -hmm. fair yeah uh, another one of those stories told in the world was uh about you know, uh, uh, basically a geisha house that came up within the Imperial City and grew to the point where it ended up being a place for unconventional people to come. And it, it acted as a hub for people to express themselves and learn about themselves and grow in a way that spawned certain characters mm -hmm. that became mainstays in future games, right? So it was almost like a like a testing ground for a lot of NPCs and a lot of early characters for them to develop and then move into other parts of the empire from there right 
Um, and again, that's not the kind of setting or the kind of game that I would have run sort of of my own volition, but to have somebody else run that and to offer that space for people to navigate that and create those kinds of characters for them to then exist in the world and then be able to exist outside of that setting was very interesting and, and very helpful for a lot of the future games that we ended up playing. And then, you know, last but not least, most recently, to have Megan come and make use of the setting and use it as a way of teaching many of the folks from It's a Mimic about L5R and give them the opportunity to explore this thing that we've been in love with for so long. Like, I imagine that was really cool for you as well. I mean, it was. I mean, I took a, a more libertarian, like, look at how I would operate within different families and how that worked, but it was very stressful to try and navigate within a world that was built by someone else because I felt like it was like, I felt I had to honor it. I had to ask questions. I had to make sure that I was doing things right to make sure that I was honoring the role that I was operating in because I wasn't operating within such a small space. I knew that what I was doing in my campaign was going to affect things in the world at large. And um, I think the communication around that was a big part. But I think to what we've spoken to a lot on this campaign and along with this like podcast is that this world that we built was not built by one person. It was led by one person, but it was built by all the players, all the people that have been within it, all the characters we've developed, the NPCs we've interacted with. That is what built the world that we that we operate within, mm-hmm. right? And I kind of just wanted to make sure that I respected that. And it was, we'll talk about it a little bit later when I deep dive a little bit more into like how I processed how to navigate within a world that somebody else built. Um, but I think at the end of the day, it's still Rokugan and it's still operating within the rules and the system in which we are given just with extra characters that we have developed, legacy people that we've been able to talk to, and the histories in which we did um, added to the world that made it easier to navigate within, right? So the rules that we constricted ourselves with gave us a play space that was easy to navigate in, but still gave us the ability to have that freedom because we had those rules to, to work within. Yeah. If that makes sense. No, it does. I think for me, um, as somebody who hasn't run a campaign yet in, in Romans Rokugan, um, and I haven't run this by Roman yet, so we'll see how he feels about this. But, hey, yo! Uh, <laughs> Today's I, I, the day! <laughs> I, 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 my personal opinion, and to be fair, I do believe that you're going to agree with me on this, is that the experience is king. Mm-hmm. So at the end of the day, if it is going to be a better experience for your players, don't worry about the canon. Yeah. And like at the like once the can- campaign is finished, if we need to tweak the history of it a little bit to fit into the world, like canonically... Fine. I would I would rather affect the way that the historians decide to put it down on paper yeah. than affect the way that people experience the game that they're playing. Agreed. Yeah. And, like, to be honest, there are some things about the game that I want to write that I, and, and want to run that I'm not sure how well they fit into your world at the time that we're currently at. Yeah, fair. And because it is a mystery game it is going to be harder for me to ask those questions. So my first inclination is going to be, you know, ask for forgiveness, not for permission, yeah. and see how it plays out. And at the end of the day, the the way I want to run it, I believe, will be an engaging, interesting storyline, and that's what's the most important part. Yeah. And so the, thing so that... the question is, Steve, like, do I also get an invitation to this Of table? course you get an invitation. Oh, fantastic. That's what he's, that's what he's saying. He's saying, I can't tell you the yeah, mystery because well, you're going to be playing in the game, yeah. my guy. Well, otherwise, I would just ask you. I have plans that I can't talk about because the haters will sabotage me. <laughs> <laughs> the internet knows too much. Oh, Lord. All right, but that being said, when we talk about running multiple games at the same time, whether it's whether you as a GM or a storyteller are playing the same in the same world in multiple timelines over and over again in different places, different clans, or having other people at your table take on a one-shot or a three-shot or what have you to play within the world you've created, what are some of the tools that you use to kind of track everything that's going on? Like I use a corkboard. I, no, you don't. And bits of string. <laughs> I can tell you that if, you don't. If you look at my bedroom wall uh, opposite my bed, he there's doesn't. actually a large cork board yeah. with uh, post-it notes and bits of string. And uh, my, Do you well, generally manically gesture at it while people come into the room? And... I, no, dude. I go full Pepe Sylvia. Um, one, of, one of our good buddies, uh, somebody who's been playing L5R with me since the very first L5R game that I ran, 
uh, took it upon himself to engage with a, uh, I think it's called Obsidian Portal. Yep. Yeah, and he built his own shit. So there's Obsidian Portal yeah. and Legend Keeper, two websites that are phenomenal resources for keeping track of different things. Uh, you know, you put up a map and then you put little pins on the map and then you click on the map and it brings up a page about that place and that specific area, which can be linked to another map. Like, it's, it is amazing the sheer wellspring of resources that exist on the internet to do those sorts of things. For those of you who don't have immediate access to that, I have one folder on my computer that is separated into a bunch of different folders. I have one for characters. I have one for locations. I have one for plots. I have one for so on and so forth. And that's how I sort things out. I love that, like, yeah, there was a system that was built for us to help that. And I remember, like, getting links to that to show the maps and things that have changed in our campaign. Because I, again, you like to use what's canon so you get the maps that are accurate. But because of the shit that we do and the fuck nonsense that we pull off, (laughs) things tend to adjust and change. And I think that that's a big piece is maps and making those adjustments. So I think that having that legend keeper and, like, that process for us was very helpful. Yeah. Um, our group did switch to Discord, which brings my next sec- my next question is how do we move all this complexity to being in an online play game versus in person? Because I started playing with this group again during the pandemic, which um, we had to shift to online play because all of us were at home and we could not like meet in person, and so we had to shift into online play, which I know for a long time for L five R for Roman you as a storyteller. We never really used maps. Like, we never, we weren't, like, the traditional, like, D&D or Call of Cthulhu or something like that where maps were at play. It was a lot of theater of the mind when it came to having battle and so on and so forth. But we used, like, coastal maps, like, where you are in the realm of the world. And that brings it down to the question of how do we bring this complexity to online play? And how did that feel for you, having to shift? It was not my preference, but it was the lesser of many evils. Mm -hmm. The greatest evil would have been not playing. That's fair. And I was more willing to adapt the way that I ran my game more than I was willing to exist without running my game with people that I wanted to spend time with. Mm -hmm. So I created more things that were were visual and digital. Uh, One thing that we'll go into next episode is character cards. Mm -hmm. I really relied on that as a way of uh, getting information across. As you were saying, using maps was a big thing. Finding songs that I could link people to and is like, hey, guys, in this scene, like, just sort of have this playing in the background. Like, those little things to try and draw people into the mood. While it required a little more doing and while it was a little bit clunky, at that point we were playing, like... 8 to 12 hour sessions online because nobody had anything better to do with a Saturday. Yeah. So, yeah, when you wake up at 9 and you finish at 9, then the 5 to 10 minutes of fiddling around trying to make sure that everything is in line while everybody's on lunch break, like, doesn't mean anything. Yeah. Right? Well, I mean, that's the whole reason I came back to L5R. Because I played in person for, like, a year back in the early teens of the 20s. Um, and then left it for playing D&D on a more regular basis. And then when the pandemic hit, my D&D group did not necessarily want to shift to being online because the DM and so on, Adam, uh, (laughs) (laughs) specifically wanted to make sure that we were in person for these things. And was willing to wait until that period of time when we could be in person again, because that was what felt more constructive for our group was that online, like in-person play was what worked for us. And we never really navigated what that would look like to shift online. And we had the podcast, so things worked out the way they did. But I didn't really have a game to play during the pandemic. And I was like, I, I need a creative outlet. I need something. Yeah. And Roman's like, come back to L5R. And I'm like, I'm not going to do that. And I'm like, fuck that. I hate you. I hate everything about L5R. I'm not doing it. And he's like, just do it. I'm like, no. And I'm like, no, 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 no. no. <laughs> and I, it still took, even when the pandemic began, it still took a good six months. And you played a full campaign in your wolf game before I joined during that pandemic to say, okay, fine, I'll do it. And again, it took a long time to convince me to do it. And it was, I actually have an affinity to, I prefer online play. 
I like in-person play for that, and Stephen, you and I have talked about it before. We enjoy yeah. the in-person play because we can have those smaller conversations and nuances between our characters that you wouldn't really have when you're playing online. Because you can have those like fist bumps and like those head nods and stuff like that between yeah. like conversation, just between the two of you as characters. And I think that that's a beautiful thing. But my brain and how it works is in when there's too much noise, it shuts everything down. Mm. So when we play in person and there's nine conversations happening at the table at the same time, I don't listen to any of them. Mm. So it's harder for me to pay attention. Whereas for some players at the table, they feel more engaged when there's seven conversations happening at a time. And so it's, it's just a difference of like how you want to engage with your campaign and how you want to play. And I've learned how to adapt to one or the other of how I am as a player. Because I will, at the table, instead of having full-on conversations with my GM, I'll have those head nods and those fist bumps with my partner that I'm playing with. Yep. But one-on-one, -on -one, when we're playing online, I'll have a full-ass conversation with an NPC. So it's like a different way of playing, almost different for focus. me. Different focus. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. know how to better explain that. There's not one that's better than the other, but I get different things that have both options. Yeah, um, I mean, no, you're taking all my talking points. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, baby. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, I, I do agree on a lot of levels. Like, I mean, when I came back, I was also during the pandemic. Um, and when we first started back up, it was pretty small groups. Mm -hmm. So it was usually three, four, maybe five people to a table. Because we could only keep so many people in our bubbles at that time. Uh, well, I mean, it was all online still, too, though. Yeah, like, that's We weren't true. really doing it in person, so it was online. Um, but I think the, the biggest issue with online is that, like, like you said, it is very hard to have more than one person talking at a time Yeah. because the way that zoom and discord and all these other, you know, like, uh, digital apps, tools we get, yeah. they, they, they are d designed to allow one person to talk at a time. Mm -hmm. That is the way that they're intended to be because they focus in on a particular person's voice and make sure that that's being heard um through a number of different like devices and like that's great for when people are having monologues and stuff like that and i mean we've gotten around some of it by just having you know little chat goofy conversations in text while people are, are doing their thing and making your your side jokes and so on and so forth there yeah but that's very out of game and and not in character and not everybody sees them not everybody sees them yeah, yeah. some people are focused on it some people aren't so it can be very exclusive i mean i think um, you know, Roman misses a lot of it a lot of the time because he's focused on being an NPC or, you know, on his notes or whatever else. So he doesn't get involved in that. It, it, there's also like a, it's a double-edged sword because on one hand, like, if you are not involved in the scene or involved in the interaction, it's not drawing your immediate attention. Yeah, you can chat and tap and text and do all these things and sort of have your fun, but it draws your attention away from the scene at hand yes. and what is going on between these two players or this player, this NPC, and you miss out on a lot of the nuance of what is going on in front of you. Yeah, yeah. I think the it, it does work better for certain characters than others. Like uh, Megan and I had this conversation after our last session, which was in person. And my most recent character is, to be frank, a bit of a dick. Yeah. He, he's just kind, he's just <laughs> he's kind like, of an asshole, he's guys. He's kind of an asshole. <laughs> he's written to be as such. He is very much sort of a traumatized, like, mommy's boy, like, has a lot of issues about, like, self-confidence and so on and so forth, and manifests that in ways that are detrimental to other people in the party because he puts them down to prop himself up. And it's very hard to do that when you're the only one talking. Yeah. Because the goal of the character is for my character and Megan's character to bounce off of each other. Yeah. It requires a tit for tat. It requires a tit for tat because you're supposed to keep me in check and keep me level. And I'm your character is supposed to keep me also in check for not saying the wrong thing. Yes. So, <laughs> so we're supposed to play off of each other, but it's very difficult to find a way like to, to get a word in edgewise while doing that digitally and like the first three or four uh campaigns we were like sessions that we did for this campaign were online and i was finding myself just not liking my character yeah because i felt like an asshole i felt like i was actually being a dick as opposed to sort of the comedic relief that i had intended him to be by having somebody be like you're being a douche mm -hmm. you know like and like pulling me back down to earth yeah and then when we switched to an in-person session and had that banter, I left the table going like, ah, like, this is why I wrote this character. I felt really good about this session. I felt like my character was doing what he was supposed to be doing. People were laughing at him instead of sort of having long, cold moments where I go, 
I just said something awful and nobody's saying anything. Yeah, because like, we could have the physical humor where you yes. and I are sitting beside each other and I hit you across the side. Yeah. And I'd be like, can yeah. you stop being a twat? Yeah. Like, <laughs> it's almost like you have to write certain characters for an online game and certain characters for an in-person game. Yeah. Right? With the un- understanding and the expectation that there is going to be a different dynamic to the way you play these characters based on whether it's going to be online or if it's going to be in a room full of people. Yeah, and I feel like because we play in a campaign with such experienced players, that it would feel easy to play those characters that have those small nuances or what have you. But it's so difficult when you transfer between online and offline. It really is, yeah. And I mean, to be fair, like you said, I, uh, I think the greatest evil is not playing at all. Uh, Roman said that, sorry. Mm-hmm. Uh, just that, like, I I had a group of friends before, well, I, they're still my friends, but before, before, Fair before, enough. before the pandemic, <laughs> we would play Magic together in person fairly regularly. Like, we would get together, play, you know, Commander, whatever, I'm not going to get into the details, that's not what this podcast is about, but we would play cards together on a regular basis. Do a thing, yeah. And then the pandemic hit. And we tried a couple different things. We tried, you know, like tabletop. We tried uh, the a uh, couple other like programs online to play online. And just basically a bunch of people were like, this doesn't do it for me. It's not my thing. I don't want to do this. And the group crumbled and fell apart. And now we'll see each other every once in a while and play games. And that's great. But it's not the same as it was prior. And I think that's a huge loss because these are people who I do enjoy interacting with. I loved getting together and sitting down across the table from each other and playing these big card games. And now we don't do that nearly as often anymore uh, just because we didn't maintain it over the course of the pandemic. Yeah. And I feel like this isn't to stop people from finding folks that they play online well with because there are some people that just don't have the access to groups physically as a lot of other people do. And I just, just like to Roman's point, it's a matter of building characters that are able to translate online well enough that it makes it good for you yep. as a person, right? I think that's the thing to remember. Uh, but that being said, the other question I have around this is, um, we talked a little about some of the tools that we use, but what are some of the ways that you track timelines and character plot hooks as e- either a player or a GM in a sto- as or as a storyteller? Like, how do you track those things? So, like, for instance, for me, every time I start a session... I write down my top three goals Mm. as a character. If I'm a player, my top three goals as a player. I want to do this, I want to do this, and I want to do this. And whether I could succeed on any of those, who gives a shit? But at least I know that those are my three things that I'm going for. Whether it's to figure out, like, the big, who the big bad evil guy is, that's probably not going to happen this session. Or I'm going to make sure that I talk to this NPC. Or I'm going to make sure that I make a good, strong connection with this PC. I always write down my top three things that I want to do as a player. Hmm. And then as long as I write them down, I've tracked them in that session. So if I go into my next session, I'll say, okay, I didn't do these two things. They're going to move into my next session, which means they're going to be these two things. I'm going to add an extra one, right? I think when it comes to this kind of thing for me, I've always been a wing it kind of person. Mm -hmm. Um, Like, for, for as a player character in particular, it's very much a see what's happening, have in the back of my brain, like, sort of what the general goals are. But, like, I find that when I write down, like, a list of, like, I want to get this, this, and this done, I start shoehorning plot points into places they don't belong. So if I'm like, oh, you know, we have to track down the legendary lost, you know, katana of this person, and, like, we're going to visit, I don't know some bathhouse or something like that to talk to somebody about something completely different. Like, I, I, <laughs> don't want to, I don't want to be thinking about the legendary Lost Katana. I want to be thinking about, okay, what would my character be doing in this situation? How do I integrate myself into the scene? Yeah. Um, I, I can get very one-tracky when it comes to like, oh, I have like a mission to accomplish. Like, sure, yes, your character does. But generally, most people don't walk around all day being like, I got to get groceries. So they don't walk up to school and be like, Hey teacher, I need to get groceries today. And then <laughs> and, yeah. and then they don't they don't go to their job after work and be like, "Hey guys, I really need to get groceries today." Like it's it, it's about adapting to the environment you're in and then when you're in the right spot, once you're off work and you're done with school and you're walking home, and you're going past the grocery store, you're like, "Hey, let's go grab some Bro, groceries." I remember I have to get groceries. Yeah. I think that's the piece of like starting every session with like your main intent mm. and then like being like, "Okay, well, I I know I'm going into this session and be like, "Okay, it's, it's a rest episode." 
Yeah. Which means we're going to be at a festival. Yes. What am I? What is my character going to do at a festival? Yeah. What is my character going to do? Okay, we're going to a bathhouse. What is my character going to do at a bathhouse? Right? So I think that's a great point of like trying to figure out what your character would do in those scenarios because they're going to change from game to game. Yep. But knowing what your ultimate goal at the end is, is helpful. Yep. Right? Yeah. Um, and then when it comes to being like a, a DM or a GM, it, it does become a bit more necessary to keep an idea, like idea of what you want to do that session. But that to me is just really about your session notes and yeah. like what you have planned. And, you know, obviously you need to be adaptable to what your players are doing and whether they're advancing faster or slower or sideways to what you are intending for to happen that session. Um, you know, Best laid plans and all that. Like, you basically need to be prepared to shift at a moment's notice. So I don't like anything to be too, like, set in stone. Like, we have to accomplish this this session. Yeah. Because, again, I don't want to start railroading my players back towards a specific thing. I want to lightly guide them in directions and let them make their own choices about <laughs> what's going to happen now. Yeah, I do still love the idea of, like, at the beginning of the ca- like the beginning of the beginning session, I decided, hey, I want to talk to this NPC. And then the GM's like, okay, but we're in a bathhouse scene. It's like, okay, I'm in a bathhouse scene. This is how I'm going to act, but I still want to talk to this NPC. <laughs> how am I going to make that happen? Do I awkwardly go over to the other side if we're gender swapped? Or do I going to have to, like, navigate, okay, well, after do I ask this man awkwardly to dinner where I'm, like, wrapped in a towel? Like, you know, like, you just have to figure out, okay, this is my goal for this this session yeah how how hard am i gonna like go towards that goal drive at it yeah. right yeah my uh my, my approach as a storyteller is very different from my approach as a player yeah as the eternal storyteller i have no player approach fair um, enough <laughs> so please don't tell us about that that'd be and great we appreciate you Hey, one of these days I'll do it for you, but you know what? We'll see how that goes. <laughs> Always a bridesmaid, never a bride. That's my life. Don't talk about it. No, I know I was talking about me. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> typically what I'll do is something in between both of your approaches where, uh, I try and look at the last things done by players of the previous session, but I also try and take immaculate notes. Mm-hmm. So, you know, so-and-so went and spoke to a ghost. So-and-so decided that they were going to fuck their crush. So-and-so decided that they were going to uh, fall down the stairs with a bottle of sake. Okay, well, you know, the last thing that happened was so-and-so falling down the stairs with that bottle of sake. So we're going to open the next session on that bottle of sake and then falling down the stairs with it. Like, they're covered in the sake. Like, the glass broke. They're all fucked up. Like, that was the cliffhanger of the last episode. That's what needs to be resolved immediately. And then sort of working backwards, but not necessarily in the exact order, looking at the things that happened and then finding the thing that has the most dramatic tension and making that the last thing that I visit first, right? Working backwards from this is this immediate thing that happened last. This was our cliffhanger. Let's resolve the cliffhanger. And then let's work backwards towards our next big cliffhanger and sort of give people a little bit of excitement at the beginning and then let people work through all of their stuff, let them explore parts of their plot while they're all still wondering like, okay, but what happened with so-and-so sleeping with their crush? Mm. We'll talk about the end of the session. Congratulations. Right? Like you you, you might not even get to get to it until halfway through the session. And that person is just like, but what about me and my crush? And sometimes that can work really well. And sometimes that can be very frustrating for players. So you need to sort of know your audience and you need to be able to have those conversations with people even before you get to the next session to look at somebody and be like, Hey, I have an idea for how I want to explore your plot point from the last session. Are you okay with it happening later? I I remember specifically we played in the the Marinade campaign where I uh, ended ended our camp like that session like fucking my revenge crush, <gasps> and then we 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 black screened it at the end of the scene like the end of the day, and then we started the next campaign with him missing. And then I was like, I hate this. <laughs> I hate everything about what you have done. <laughs> but it, but it, it did hook me because yeah. we went through, because like he's like, you wake up, that person is missing, moving on to the next person. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me? 
<laughs> I mean, I went through other people's stories until they came back to mine, and then we resolved mine in the end. Yeah. So, like, I fuck you. I see you, <laughs> I yeah. see you from space. Yeah, now you can <laughs> now you can see the map, right? Now you can see all the red string on the yeah. corkboard with the Pepe Sylvia. Oh, oh, fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, oh Lord. Yeah. So I guess the next thing that we should talk about is um, sort of on a similar tangent of like when you come when you look at games that have multiple storylines that continue on, you're gonna end up with legacy characters, mm-hmm. and we love legacy characters. We fucking love. We love a good legacy, legacy character. Like there, there is something really satisfying about having characters, whether they be NPCs or or PCs, showing up again later. To show their growth, to show how they've changed, to show that the world has changed around them. Um, like, it, it really does give the campaign, uh, like, almost like a rooting point, basically, yeah. where you can sort of point back to it and go, like, hey, you remember this guy or this girl? Remember the things that you did with that person? Yeah, well, they're back. And this is how they feel about it. And, like, this is how it, like, either messed them up or progressed them in the world or, you know, changed their outlook on X, Y, Z. Uh, and, you know, it does give that opportunity for the world to sort of be built around that particular person um, or, or persons and showcase how it's different or how it's the same. Um, and, like, when it comes to player characters as well, you really do get to sort of get this opportunity of being like, oh, cool, like here's a take on one of my favorites. You know, yeah. somebody that I put a lot of time and effort and, you know, uh, managed to make it through to the other side with them alive. And whether they're good or bad is up for debate. It's sometimes it's very interesting for both of those. But to, to see them represented by your, your GM as a non-player character interacting with your new player characters can be really really just a fun experience to see somebody else's take on it and like you know i think an interesting challenge as a game master as well to basically try and exhibit the qualities that that player put into them and represent their evolution as a person since the last time they were played um and from the other side of things when they do end up on sort of like the the evil side coming back as a villain can be can put extra stakes in the game you know it means that we're really not looking at that character as just sort of the bad guy of the week there is that extra personal involvement in like hey like this is my guy well because it could be intentional or not intentional yeah right it's just that it because you could be playing this character being like no i'm like super good but then the and depending on the story and the trajectory of how things are going there might be a villain in someone else's story Absolutely. And I think that's what, to earlier we were talking about how multiple um, clan storylines that you can play, they're all going to have different versions of what happened during a certain event. Absolutely. Which means you could be the villain or the hero in someone's story. Yep. I mean, one of the games that we wrapped up, um, one the, the Marinay game, in fact, Yeah. Uh, the second half of it, I played a unicorn. Mm-hmm. And there were a series of events that happened in that. My unicorn was a good dude. Yeah. He was super friendly. Super like happy go lucky, and there was a series of events that occurred. By the end of it, he was not such a good dude. Yep. There were just like he he had had his sort of like viewpoint flipped on a pin. I've head, seen some flipped. shit. He He's said seen some one shit day. indeed. Yeah. And, and, I mean, we we haven't seen that character come back as of yet, but like, well, it'll to, happen. Steve. I wouldn't be surprised. But just it, it is interesting to see how that that could play out. And uh, I might be playing a marinade campaign, and it may come about. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> So yeah, it just, I think it does give that extra sort of uh, stakes. You get stake, it gives players stakes in the world and and the involvement and like wanting to write interesting characters to see them come back. I have a couple questions for you guys. Then let's just head in that direction. Yeah, sure, sure. Cool. throw okay. it down. Okay. So I mean, this game has been running for a very long time. What is one of your favorite legacy stories, and what made it so memorable? Um, I'll start, and I'll talk about uh, Tamari Megumi, which is like I. I I referenced her in a previous episode in which I had built a Tamori, which was my biggest storyline character, and I did not intend her to be that in any way, shape, or form. I built her incorrectly into the Rokugan world, but then Roman as a GM kind of took that character and evolved her over time without me being involved in the campaign. Um, Because I left halfway through that campaign to say, I can't do this anymore, fuck you, I'm out. And then, but he took that character and rolled with the aspects that I kind of gave her and the characteristics that I gave her 
but then molded into what a true dragon should be over time. Because she was young when I created her, so she had time to kind of evolve over the process of the um, seasons that the campaign took. Mm. And then there was one day where Roman came to me and he was like, hey, like, there's this character that... <laughs> <laughs> wants to remove the Tamori name from like the dragon like from the like the dragon clan championness. And I was just like, she would not do that. Mm -hmm. And he was just like, what? And I was like, no, she would not do that because she murdered someone to put the Tamori name where it is. Yeah. Why would she give it to some twat <laughs> who asked her to change the name to someone else for the clan championship? And he's like, would you like to role play that out? And I'm like, yes, yes, man. I would love to do that. <laughs> Is that what harpooned you back in the game? <laughs> no, because it was not what harpooned me back in the game. No. It was it, during the pandemic because I remember playing um, online when we did it. But he asked me to come back and play out that conversation with that character. To be like, no, you cannot change the name to the Tamori name. You should be proud to have the Tamori name, X, Y, Z, certain, 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 certain conversations. And that was my first introduction to the campaign that this man started in that process. Right. And um, it was just me coming back to, again, play a legacy character that I had built years ago that was not built to be a legacy character, but just happened to be. Sure. I mean, I think that's generally what happens. I, I, I don't write most of my characters to be legacy characters. No. Like, you play them, and then as you get to feel them out and... and you know, become that character more and more, you get a better idea of, like, how impactful is this person actually going to be. Yeah, and I think that it was a good thing from Roman as a as a storyteller to come to me to be like, hey, I want this character to do this thing, this is happening right now. And I said, no, she wouldn't do that. Mm. And he respected my choice as the original character creator, but I gave him full freedom to do whatever she wanted to up until that point. Yeah. And I was like, she would not make that decision. And we had that conversation, and I came and role-played that, and then after that conversation, I gave up full creative freedom from that character. Yeah. Because I said, I think that you understand at this point what this character wants going forward. And I give you full freedom. And we've played many campaigns with this character appearing. And I've never questioned Roman's decisions on what she does. Fair enough. Yeah. I mean, uh, like, my experience is actually somewhat similar. Um, yeah. Because I started playing uh, way back when, early, like, 2010s. Um, and the game, the group that we were playing with was gigantic. Yeah. We had a lot, a lot of people and I signed on for the first couple of sessions. I made this character, uh, really enjoyed the character, but at the end of the day, I, I made the decision that I wasn't going to continue with it because I just felt that there were a couple too many people at the table. And for me, that was not what I was looking for in my experience. Same, same. And so I stepped away from the table, but every once in a while I would get a message or a, or Roman would pull me aside when we were hanging out and just be like, Hey. Like, this is happening. How do you feel about this? How would you like this to play out? What would you like this to sort of, like... <laughs> what would you... Like, is there a reason you think your character would do this or the characters around him would do the thing? And I would give my feedback, and then I would get a report back, like, a week or two later, being like, yeah, this is what happened. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay, cool. That's really cool. Don't, 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 yeah. don't. Great, 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 great. <laughs> it, 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 it culminated in my character's death, which I have zero regrets about. Like, I think it was an interesting progression for another player's character who my character was married to. Mm -hmm. And it made for a really interesting storyline that I think has a lot of implications for the, the world as a whole as the, the story has played out over the years. Yeah. Um, and, I mean, for the longest time, I was just very happy with that amount of uh, effect that my character had had, even in my absence. But now in our most recent campaign... He's come back in the form of an ancestor and is haunting one of our other players as, as an ancestor to her and is basically giving her advice on what she should be doing and how she should be doing it and is there to, air quotes, help her. Uh, and it's, it's just a lot of fun to see him come back as a new iteration of that character and you know, being involved in the world again. Yeah. Um, and just goes to show that, like, yeah, any of your characters can have an effect on the game at any point. I mean, I think in in-game years, we're talking something like 50, 60 years? Yep. Yeah. Or more? Like, yeah, like, it's well down the timeline since he was around and actually living and doing things, and he is still coming back and having an effect on the events that we are currently playing out, and that's really cool. Yeah, that's fair enough. So, I have many favorite legacy characters <laughs> as the st main storyteller in our campaigns <laughs> the one that i am choosing to highlight today 
is one where I got to use L5R as a way of showing someone something about themselves. I wrote a character as a NPC that was meant to be a little bit villainous, was meant to be a little bit problematic, was meant to act as a helper, but someone that my characters wouldn't enjoy, sorry, my players wouldn't enjoy interacting with. And I wrote this character based on somebody that I knew. And later on, I spoke to this person and I was like, hey dude, um, I just want your thoughts and feelings on how this character should act, who this character is, yada yada, like, play, like, work with me on this, like, am I playing this true to form? And they were like, yeah, this is pretty cool, this is pretty fun, like, oh, you know what, I think I would like to play L5R. And I was like, okay, I would like you to play this character's origin story. Okay. I would like you to write this character based on these criteria that I've given you and based on who this character is at this point, but I want you to play them five years younger. Mm. And so they played this character's origin story. And we both we knew both knew what the beats of that story were going to be. And this buddy of mine is, in spite of a lot of disagreements that we have had in the past about storytelling, a consummate storyteller with phenomenal dedication to telling the story that we have agreed on. So he knows how it's going to turn out, and he hits his marks flawlessly. He plays through those moments and gives you these wonderful explorations of who this character is and what they're going through and all the process of what that looks like. And because of his compliance and his willingness to explore this character based on him, he discovered a lot of things about himself mm. because this character was based on a very young version of him. Yeah. This character was based on a version of him that he no longer was. But by looking at who this character was and then building the character that this character became and then building the character that that character became, he sort of went through this process of evaluating who and what he was as a person and played through all of these different stages of this character's life. And at the end of it all... We both sort of sat there and looked at this this story that we told together and him getting to interact with his children and him getting to act, interact with, you know, his his second wife and all of these things that he's built and all this this legacy that he has created. And I think it's one of the few players that I've had who have played through the entirety of a life cycle with a character to the point where they felt so satisfied in that experience and so like vindicated and so seen as both a player and as the character that they had designed and helped design. It was, uh, yeah, by and far one of, one of my favorite legacy stories mm. and it's like one of many <laughs> fair enough you certainly have a nice pool to pull from <sighs> yeah I'm, I'm you're welcome so, i'm so lucky to be surrounded by so many wonderful legacies and so many fantastic stories great thank you i don't yeah. think that you know, <laughs> thank you oh. thank you so much <laughs> you know, so. Mm. so on the on the flip side of the coin though what makes a good legacy villain so we've talked a lot about like characters that have been, you know, heroes or, or main player characters. Like what what makes a good character that keeps coming back that isn't a good guy? Come on, boy. Won't you shake this poor sinner's, sinner's hand? I, I, I at the end of the day, I feel like a good villain is someone who is a misunderstood villain. And I think that happens a lot in L5R because, again, every clan has a different perspective of how things occur within, like, whatever story is told, whatever rumor is told. Um, and, like, I have not necessarily had the honor of having a lot of good legacy villains other than the one main one from the previous campaign that we played. And that was because it was played by a player player who played this character who became, ended up being a villain within our campaign later down the line. Which which character was this? Uh, the Black Queen. Ah, yes. <laughs> that's the only one, that's necessarily the only legacy villain I've ever really played with because I came into the campaign late. And then, like, again, legacy means it was a player character turned villain in my mind. There's Dragon as well. You're, uh, we just talked about it. Uh, yeah, but I never played in those campaigns. Oh, okay, I see. I played in the campaigns that happened afterwards... Um, my character never became the villain. No, your character didn't. My character fought the villain who 
was played by a player character who I never played in those campaigns for. Sure, no, fair enough. But that that is still a legacy villain. It is legacy villain. Yes. But it was more along the sense of, like, my character didn't much care for them because he ruined her legacy. Oh, sure. So was going after him to be like, you fucked up my family. And then, again, at the end of the campaign, ended up being like, this is not worth my time. And then moved on with her life. Right. Right. But so I don't really see that as a... For me, as a character player... There was less stakes. Because there was less weren't. stakes. That's because fair. I was not necessarily involved with the, the creation of the character that character or sense. what have you. Um, but I do feel like a legacy villain does bode more uh, like determination and or like dedication from players when it is an old character you recognize. So it does take one or two campaigns to create a really good legacy character that you're willing and wanting to destroy. Yes. Because as much as my old character, like Tamori Megumi that I spoke to earlier, wanted to destroy this legacy villain, I was no longer that character. Hmm. I gave that character to the GM long ago, and I was happy with the decisions that she made. I made a new character that was just following that person to be like, I'm following you blindly because I trust you as yep. a character. But I don't have as many stakes in the game as you do. Totally valid. Yeah. Right. Whereas like the Black Queen that we played in our game, I had a lot of stakes against because I had a lot of characters in that game fighting that character directly. Right. right. So, but. Yeah, I, I agree that like stakes are an important part of what makes a good legacy villain. Yeah. Like the the Black Queen was a character that before they fell, left a bloodline, left descendants to look back and say, no, 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 this is someone who is a stain on our honor. This is somebody who is going to plague the world, and it's our responsibility to deal with them. Mm -hmm. Like, a good legacy villain is someone that you were fond of at one point. Like, uh, there's there's a a saying that I'm, I'm fond of, and it's, you can't uh, hate someone that you didn't once love. And you need to have affection and attachment to a character in order for their fall, in order for their villainy to really hurt and to really hook into you. And really be villainous, right? Yeah, like you, you can have, look, I am evil for the sake of being evil. I am, right, I hate you. I am, like... a, I am just, I am John Badman. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Whereas the people that are connected to that person, their family, their descendants are going to have a little bit more stakes in that game, right? Yeah. So I, I agree and I disagree. I think that a good villain, for you to properly hate them, or or, or not, not even necessarily hate them, but it's just, it's about relatability. Yeah. So like, it is about, so I mean, I think you can get relatability by having played with that character and knowing that character and, and you know, going through things with that character. But I think you can also have relatability through you know, uh, empathizing or recognizing a series of events that have led them to do a thing. Or identifying with their pain. Yes. Like, you're heartbroken. Yeah. I've felt that way before. But, like, but we're specifically talking about legacy villains. Sure. It can still apply. It can still apply. 100%. Yeah. I mean, yeah, like, I think, yeah, I guess that is stepping away from legacy a little bit. But, yeah, no, I think for legacy villains, you're right. Like, I think a good legacy villain... But, but I still think that it can still apply. So, like, if you're a person who's a courtier or a shugenja who are known for seeking knowledge of past integrations of people that are tendencies to be leaning towards more of the evil spectrum, they're going to read their story and find the nuances that are like, oh, no, no, this person was heartbroken. Mm -hmm. And you're going to understand them a little bit more. So it might be legacy in the sense where, yes, it was a character that was played previously, but you might be a new player at the table that doesn't know that that was played by another person. Sure. But you as a character who might be a person who's a seeker of knowledge will learn their story and be like, no, no, they're just a heartbroken puppy that is seeking validation and exception from the people that it wants to. <laughs> Right? I love that in this example, Yurisako from the last episode is just like, so you all think he's a stone cold killer, but in <laughs> fact, this motherfucker got his heart broken like five times. Five times. Let me put on a timeline name on how this guy got heart <laughs> broken. Right, all these things that happened to but this that's man. the thing. And I think that's the relatability to someone who's coming into a legacy game that you aren't necessarily a part of. And I think, Steve, you and I talked about that mm. at the beginning of this episode where we came into a game that was played by long-standing players for years and years and years. Yeah. And we did not have that same emotional connection to the villains that 
the heroes or what have you, these people would be like, oh, like, this is Sokka, blah, 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 we showed up, great, oh, phenomenal. You're like, I don't know who the fuck that is. Yeah. Great. Like, we had that experience. <laughs> Absolutely did. But as players, we could be like, okay, let me do a knowledge roll. Great, you learn this story. Phenomenal. Yeah. Heartbreak story. So you as a character can learn about those things. Because there, there was a character that both of us played in a campaign with that was a legacy villain. Uh, it was during our cab, crab campaign. Mm. And he, mm. rolled, he rolled up. Did some super sleazy shit, <laughs> but we figured out that the reason he was doing it was from a desire to protect his homeland. Yeah. At the end of the day, he, he wanted to make some money while he did it, but yep. like, you know, like that was generally the idea was that he wanted to protect the homeland and like empower this group of people to be, you know, able to take over and do the way that he wants to do it. So I think in, in like full circle, I think that what makes a great legacy villain is someone who those who have played at the table for four or five games at a time can emotionally connect with, yeah. and those who are coming in for the first time can also connect Re with, react mm. makes yeah. a great legacy villain. That's fair. Damn. You're yeah. welcome. <laughs> Mic drop. I'm yeah, okay. leaving. <laughs> and that's the episode, folks. And that's, that's the episode, guys. I'm done. <laughs> Another important thing to talk about is, as a starting point for our campaigns, uh, alternate histories. So for those of you looking to start your own L5R campaigns, there's a couple of cool places that you can start if you don't want to run with the canon story. The Imperial Histories 1 and 2 provide some excellent alternative histories for you to create your own campaign with if you don't know where to start. And here are three such examples. The first of which is the Thousand Years of Darkness, or the KYD which is an alternate timeline in which Fulang was victorious at the second day of thunder. This pocket reality was found somewhere within the depths of the realms of dream, given existence by the power of the dreams of Fulang. Uh, the second is the Togashi dynasty, an alternate Rokugan wherein Togashi defeats Hante in the tournament to decide who should become emperor at the dawn of the empire. The resulting setting is one full of interesting supernatural wonders and a stronger presence of knowledge non-human races as opposed to the default setting. Hmm. The third, and I possibly the most accessible, is the Empire of the Emerald Stars. In this alternate setting, the Empire of Rokugan is in its fourth millennium and has extended their reach to much of the stars. This setting is excellent for anyone wanting to play something with a Star Wars feel. Because who doesn't love samurai with laser swords? That's the most accessible? I, I was going to say, is that... <laughs> Lightsabers is the most accessible? That's what we're going with? I mean, for motherfuckers who are just like, oh, I don't know how much I know about samurai, fuck it, let's do beam sabers. Sure. Like, fair enough. I mean, we're in, like, rural Japan Rokugan, and then we're gonna go... <laughs> it's the most different, I'll give you that. Fair enough. You're like, it's so different that it doesn't matter what I do, you know what I mean? Like... <laughs> well, and, like, all three of these alternate settings are really fun. Yeah, And really fair. cool. Like, of the three, I am, I am a cheap mark for the Togashi Dynasty, because, you know, Dragon Clan till I die, <laughs> green and gold till I'm dead and cold. Fair enough, um, fair enough, fair enough. But, like, the, the, so the Togashi Dynasty provides an interesting shift in the way that the Empire functions. Because the Empire at large is like, nope, we don't mess around with spirits or the spirit realms, and we are super xenophobic, and there's all these things that, like, the Empire at large doesn't accept and is afraid of. Mm -hmm. The Togashi Dynasty does away with all of that. The Togashi Dynasty is very accepting. The Togashi Dynasty focuses on enlightenment and seeking new horizons and exploring new things. And that world and that universe as written is one that is more mystical in nature. Yeah. So you will run into a world that is a little more in line with what D&D sort of is. There are more Kenku. There are more... Uh, Zokujin, there are more Kitsu that sort of exist within the Empire proper and have a place in the Empire proper. Yeah, because I would say like within Rokugan, and even when I moved into my Marinay, like half campaign, and moved into D&D, &D, I was very specific to say, we're all human or human variant. Whereas in Rokugan, yes, there are other like species that you can play. It's just like I feel like if you were to do more, it's just accessible. Use it. Yeah. yeah. Right. So 
Open some doors. Yeah, open doors for yourself as a storyteller and you as a player. Like, yep. open those doors. Uh, is there any alternate history or alternate setting that you guys would find interesting? Whether either from the ones that, you know, we've listed here or from any of the ones that you know about? <laughs> Emerald stars, give me lightsabers. I'm going to do it. Like, we're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm not opposed to lightsabers. Let's put it that way. Um... Yeah, I, don't, I think I think for the Togashi Dynasty, it does sort of appeal to a certain extent because, yeah, like it would be nice to have sort of that two-toned uh, option. Because I mean, in most other games, you can choose a race and a class. Um, so, well, maybe maybe most other games is a stretch. I'm not actually positive about that, but D and D lets you choose both. So, <laughs> uh, but D and D, great. Uh, yeah. uh, so you, it would be really interesting because I mean, like I'm. And correct me if I'm wrong here. I do believe you can currently play, you know, like a Naga if you wanted to. Yeah, you you can play many of the non-humans in Alpha R. It just it, they all come with their own hiccups and hang-ups. It's yes. the easiest to just play a human. Yeah, but I feel like that's happens in D and D and other um, RPG TT RPGs as well, because depending on what timeline and what word you're playing in, sometimes the Drow are not accessibly accepted true or like like elves versus uh dwarfs are are it's constantly at a war so i think there's these things that you take in consideration when you're playing any kind of ttrpg it's just what you're going to take into consideration when you're playing an l5r campaign fair but i do think that D is making some pretty big steps away from that stuff now oh absolutely uh, which is great yeah like, wizard of the coast is like reworking all of their verbiage yes yeah. which is brilliant and i'm really glad to see that that's something that they're considering now yeah um um, whereas with Rokugan, like, it, it is basically play a human samurai or suffer the consequences, you Fair. know? Like, yeah, you know, you're not wrong. Yeah. You can't yeah. just stroll into a Kyuden as a Naga and be like, hey guys, like, how's it going? Got any quests to do, you know? Like, <laughs> Let me play matchmaker for you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, just not, it's just not going to happen. Yeah. So, like, the idea of, like, for the Togashi Dynasty really opening that up, and making it so that you can play a Naga Samurai. Or yeah, it feels opening and welcoming and more like uh, a, a world that our generation can play within. Yeah. A little bit more freedom. Yeah, a little bit more options and, like, yeah, availability of choice. Yeah. It would be kind of nice. Um, yeah. 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 I mean, that being said, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, Lassie on this episode around... I played... I ran a campaign within the world that Roman built. And by built, I mean... A lot of people that we played with created this world from one perspective and then we just shot off with it and our story built itself, right? So um, I want to talk about what I'd like to approach doing a campaign within a world that somebody else built. And there's a couple of things that I did to kind of help and not help that I learned along the way that I think will be very helpful for other players. What was the name of your game? Um, the Chronicles of Mortality versus Morality. And you'll learn why it was called that in a little bit here. Um, so one of the things that I took into consideration and struggled with was the fact that this was a game that I DM'd after not having game mastered or DM'd for anything in a long while that was worth, I'm going to say worth mentioning because it was like one shots or Christmas stories or what have you that I played with my group just to have like fun, right? This is the first time where I took things seriously right. and wanted to tell a story with the people that I cared about, right? Um, the other thing that I took into consideration is because I was playing in a world created by people that I loved, that was loved by so many people that I respected and cared for, the idea of doing something wrong or disappointing someone was kind of a hard pill to swallow. Ew, gross. So for instance, in Rome, when we talked about this, I burnt down a part of the Asawa Mori. So basically the, like, the Asawa Forest. Um, but for me in my game, even though it was painful for Roman to hear that, I literally had a one, one hour scene of my players standing there at five o'clock in the morning watching this forest burn and taking in the replications of what this meant. Hmm. So the different characters had a different reaction to watching this happen. Like one character woke up and saw the smoke and stood there and watched it. Another character woke up, stood by that character and watched what was happening from a distance and understood that what had happened in that forest that they were a part of caused this beautiful landscape to be destroyed. 
Right. And so I, I took that moment with my players so they would understand the impact that they had on the world. Yeah. So I, as a GM, knew what impact I had on the world because I had that conversation with Roman, who had built this role for years. But I made sure my players felt it mm. from the different perspectives of the characters that they were playing. So not only that, but for three, I didn't know what story I initially wanted to tell. I had an idea, but it required a lot of finesse to make it work. But this is kind of how I did it and the tactics that I used. I limited the clans that were playable to be able to be focused in. So I used the Phoenix, which um, was specifically drew me in because of specific things like the Elemental Council and the fact that they're passive in nature. And felt like this brought a lot of like simplified playable space for new players to play within. I didn't initially want it to be a Phoenix game. It just ended up that way based on how I kind of did my research and talked with my players and felt like this was a safe space to play within. I took inspiration from previous PCs played by literally one PC and myself played by a good friend of mine who was the destroyer of the big bad evil guy from the previous campaign that we played in. So the black community we spoke towards previously in this episode, my friend killed that character. Hmm. And I... Uh, it was one of those things where I wanted to do something with my players where they would have a common goal, but also have a couple of different things. I really wanted them to specifically talk about how NPCs and PCs would have a different reaction to a certain timeline event that occurred. So this one character killed this big bad evil guy. Cool. Every clan is going to have a different reaction to how that occurred. They're all going to have a different story that, you know, feeds into that. Whether it was good, evil, neutral, what have you. Every clan is going to have a different reaction. And so I actually gave, at the beginning of my story, every player who played in a different clan a different version of that story. Nice. Of, of how the Black Queen was destroyed by this one person. Right. Which means every single player who played in a different clan had a different response to this person existing. Right. Whether they want to destroy them, love them, care for them, defend them. Right. Right. Um, so this gave me the opportunity to have my players have interpersonal conversation right away mm. because this character was the quest giver of my story. Huh. So all of the players had an opportunity to give each player a different perspective of how that story played out and how they would interact with each other. Mm -hmm. Right, which helped me as a GM kind of direct the story from there and how, who were the stronger players, so on and so forth. Another major thing that I did focus on was my player character stories. So I was lucky enough that my group of players put a lot of attention and detail into their 20 questions mm -hmm. nice. and gave me a huge backstory. I've said it before in our podcast that Roman was jealous of the fact that I gave my players a deadline and all of them met it. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy talk. <laughs> players don't meet deadlines. Sure I do. But that made me, as a GM, feel inspired <laughs> to put work into making sure the story worked towards their advantages and disadvantages they took as players, right? Um, it's like, so, for instance, one character took Bitter Patrol. So I used this late love of his life to inspire and persevere his storyline moving forward, right? One character dabbled too far into the void, which reached into consequences that even though I told him as a player this was going to happen, he said, nope, I'm okay with that, mm. right? So this helped me navigate in my own play space instead of worrying too much about the effect it's going to have on the main storyline that Roman was true to because I was focusing so much on only five characters, mm. right? I was focusing on their stories. I also did midweek content where each character got to interact with NPCs of their own comfort and receive a little bit more one-on-one -on -one coaching. So again, all these players have never played L5R before in their lives. Mm -hmm. So when I did this midweek content, I was able to have those conversations and say, your character would know this, but if you want to make this choice, that's okay. This is going to be the consequence. Because mm -hmm. I could have that conversation one-on-one -on -one in a little bit more of a more intimate setting versus at a table with another six to seven players to be like, if you fuck up, too bad, son. Like, <laughs> <laughs> So I feel like that was very imperative to having a brand new table to the game because it gave them a little bit more of that intimate setting of you're a Shugenja, you would know this. Yep. You're a Bushi, you would know this, but in your nature, you will probably protect this person. Mm -hmm. So on and so forth, right? 
I also was very good about checking in with the original content creator, which of course was Roman, a few times with like my hit of like, if I hit a knowledge wall of, hey man, this character did this, I don't know what the fuck to do. <laughs> what would happen? And him and I would have a tit for tat of like, well, this would be the result technically, but make it work for the world that you have created. Yes. Right? And I think that that's a... Communication is key, especially if you're working within another world that you're, another person is DM'd. Um, but I just felt like that helped me a lot, was that I did have that resource that I could work to. Fair enough. So some of my final thoughts in DMing Alphavar for the first time and with a story built by so many other people. So for one, the rules of the land along with strategic consequences and rewards within the system made it easier for me to navigate as a GM. Basically, the more rules to be expected and have more results made it easier for my players to make decisions and knowing that there were consequences, but also knowing that their honor will be rewarded as blessings. D&D... It is not, or when not using a module, requires a lot of homing and humming about these pieces. So we, I feel like D&D kind of moves towards the, your chaotic good, your chaotic evil, X, Y, Z, to kind of determine what your consequences X, Y, Z are. But I feel like within Rokugan, there are rules. Yep. And there are consequences whether you're one way or the other. So you know that from player start one, day one, whether what you do is good or bad, right? So it made it easier for my players and myself as a GM to navigate with him. Two, communicating with players. Uh, what they would know as characters is imperative. There is nothing worse than having a consequence for an action when the character, you would know what fucking would happen. Yes. Even though you as a player don't know. Professional courtesy. <laughs> Yep, that, yep. <laughs> that is a thing that we didn't get to discuss yet this episode, but it is very important as a, as a small tangent. Professional courtesy. <laughs> Professional courtesy. This is one of my favorite rules to employ with people who know the setting. Mm -hmm. It's not something that you do with beginners, because you want beginners to learn the setting. Yeah. It's something that you do with people who have done it over and over and over and over again. You and I both know that my character would know the appropriate honorific for interacting with this person. You're right. I'm not going to punish you. The role play that you are engaging in is more important than you knowing the honorific. When you have used the appropriate honorific three or four times, go ahead. Yeah. I, I, I will extend the courtesy to you. You get you get professional courtesy. Yeah, I also think that like the professional courtesy with newer players is also more important because they don't know necessarily what the professional courtesy is. So like there was an instance in my campaign where someone had to grab a sword off a dead body. Yep. And I said, dude, you as a samurai know touching the dead body is a big no no. Yeah. That's gonna take an honor loss, my guy. Do you still want to move forward with this decision? Well and in those situations, you're correcting the behavior actively. Yeah, it but, is. But it's hey, professional you, courtesy. You you know that you wouldn't do this, as opposed to, oh, I have enough <laughs> arrows on me because I create them in my downtime. Like no. that's professional courtesy. Fair enough. Fair enough. Right? Yeah. Like you are good enough at your job yeah. that you rock up to this fight with a quiver full. I don't need you to tell me that, that during your downtime yeah. you made arrows because. That's what your school does. Yes. Yeah. I, I think the bottom line, though, is that you, in either case, whether you're playing with an experienced player or a brand new player, the goal is to educate, not punish. Yes. 100%. 100%. So with a new player, like, oh, you said, you know, San instead of Dono? Okay. Just so you know, this guy's a big deal. This is what you should be using this, as an honorific. Do you this choose honorific. or not choose to use the yes. honorific? Yeah. Yeah. It, would you like to make that mistake as a character? If you would like to, that's fine. If you'd like to take it back, that's also okay. We'll move to Dono. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. As an experienced player, you just go, ah, uh, yeah, he's focusing more, he or she is focusing more on the role play that's happening right now. Yeah. It's not that big of a deal. We don't use these honorifics on a day-to-day -day basis as people. Yep. It makes sense. It Punish happens. me. I don't it care. It happens. Yeah. But like, if you were to go like, oh, remember, he's Dono, it'd be like, oh, yeah, of course. And you would hand wave at it anyways and move along with your lives because there are more important things to what's happening right now. That's fair. Yeah. 
So to finish on my final two points, my third point for DMing this game is that I do now have a lot more confidence in my DMing than I did before because I played a new system that not only have I never DM'd, but that other people that I had to teach. And um, I got to flex a lot of muscles that I have not flexed in a long time, right? It's a very different process teaching someone something. Uh, four is when playing in someone else's play space, they don't have to keep the canon if they don't want to. Um, but keep that communication open. And also if there are real lore, if there is real lore available to you, use it. I spent so much time digging into the proper timelines of who was the elemental master at the particular time <laughs> because Roman in our current play space never built an elemental council. And so I spent a lot of time because in my mind, I was like, if I know there's a map or a character or this vault like that exists within the timeline, I am going to use it. Yep. Because if anything, if I can't stay true to the canon that we have created, I'm going to revert back to the canon that was previously created. Yep. And that is what I did. I timelined the shit out of that fucking stuff <laughs> to figure out who would be on the council at that time. Um, and that helped me a lot. Is use, And I think that was, Roman, you even told me that. Just use what is available to you if you have it. Sure. And we, yeah. And what do you think he does? He just makes up what the fuck he wants. <laughs> <laughs> I... I will try my best to lean into precedent. Yeah. If I know that there is a, a place or a time or a thing that I can reference, of course I'll do it. What year are we in? Okay, cool. We're in these lands. We're playing a game with the crab. Who is the current crab daimyo? There's no listed crab daimyo. Or worse, mm, current crab daimyo is dead in my timeline. Okay, I guess I have to Who make Who is their second to command? There was no second to command? Great. I'm going to make my own guy. <laughs> the L5R wiki is so wild because it's current family daimyo, their immediate children, their spouses. Like, you, you can pull anything up. You just get names and positions and all of these things exist and are readily available and accessible. Yeah. If you want them. But that's the thing, because at D&D, there's tons of modules that help you with those, like, timelines, world spaces, all those things. L5R, that doesn't necessarily exist, other than timeline stuff. L5R is a lot of proper nouns. Yeah. Who Who is the current head of the Chrysanthemum Festival in the year 1165. <laughs> you can find that. <laughs> you can find that guy if you really want to. You can look at that dude and you can probably find his three descendants like because that is the sort of game that L5R is. Family, descendants, and like moving forward. What year did this war happen? It happened in this year. These are the people that died. These are the people that were relevant of who died. Like that is the kind of game that L five R is. But as you progress forward, coming back to the, you know the the legacy content and and a evolving game, that information becomes less and less relevant, and you're going to have to rely more and more on your own game notes to provide those names and legacies and so on and so forth. Oh, for sure. And that's only assuming that we've played with those characters. One hundred percent. Yeah. Because, like, in our campaign, we had a PC who played a character that was going to be the elemental of water. Like, yeah. the elemental master of water. Mm -hmm. And I knew that was going to happen. I basically did the story of how that person became that person. Sure. But the other elemental councils were, the, were of the correct timeline. Yeah. But I also had to come up with a reason why the previous elemental of water was not there. <laughs> so, <laughs> yep. I, I killed them. So, <laughs> so like... Another cool thing about the game is that you can retroactively make people important. Mm -hmm. So like, oh, I wrote this character and they did all these cool things and this, that, and the other. Why were they able to accomplish all these things? Who were they that history decided that they were going to be such a badass? Well, they happen to be the descendant of so-and-so. Yep. Yeah. Right? Like, because there is such a rich history... It's easy enough for you to look backwards in time and say, hey, I am the third cousin of this established great hero. Yep. And that's why I'm relevant. Yeah. That's why my character is a big deal. And some, some people might find that to be diminishing in many ways because of the setting and because of the way that it is. Like your ancestry, your heraldry is such a big thing. When you walk into a room and people are like, oh, you are... 
Togashi so-and-so. Oh, well, no, well, you're the great-great-grandson of Togashi Satsu, former imperial governor, like... That's where that Lore Haldry comes in. Yeah, like, titles, titles, (laughs) accolades, accolades, right? Like, that's kind of what makes your characters cool. And in some ways, it's it's more cool when your character becomes cool retroactively, as opposed to, like, I've written my character to be... To be cool. <laughs> yeah. I wrote my character to be cool? No, 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 no. My character did this cool thing. Oh, what, like, recently unearthed imperial doc- documents have discovered that, like... This character is actually a descendant from yeah. this character, right? Like, well, that's why, I like, in the story that I told, <clears throat> I took a PC that was played by one of our good friends, Cole, who will <laughs> name. Um, <laughs> and he was so well known for being the heroine, but I made sure that there were clans who did not see him as such, right? Because, like, it's so there were clans that did seek that, you know, having a common enemy was a good thing mm. versus destroying that person. Now we have nothing to communally fight against. Mm-hmm. And now we're going to communally fight against you. So he became the enemy to some clans, which he didn't really see. And he's like, I don't understand why people hate me. I got rid of the big evil. And it's like, because you took away the thing that gave us liberty. Yeah. Right. So, anyways. Yeah. That's yeah. that. Well, yeah. So... That's all for this episode on Legend of the Five Rings. Make sure to like and comment with any ideas you've come up with for the start of your own campaign. Follow or subscribe, because the next episode we will be giving you more tools to help create memorable adventures in the Emerald Empire. For more info and details, please check the show notes. When you're resolved from the beginning, you will not be perplexed. This understanding extends to everything. Be resolved, young samurai, and tell the world what you have witnessed here today.